Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is our first Cyber Policy Center event of the year. We've beat the students here. Uh, and uh, it couldn't be on a more timely topic uh, with a more impressive group of speakers. Uh, we are going to be talking today about ensuring responsible AI innovation, uh, comparing governance paradigms. And uh, we are honored today to have uh, Carmen Artigas here uh, to deliver uh, the introductory remarks. Um, but uh, first, I just want to give a little bit of background on uh, the Cyber Policy Center and what you can uh, see this year. This is the first event in uh, our new program on governance of emerging technologies. Uh, and we are partnering uh, with the McCourt Institute, with what's now the Project Liberty Institute, of which we are a part. Uh, and uh, this is a program that is not only looking at governance of generative AI, but also uh, other technologies such as blockchain, uh, virtual reality, and the like. And uh, this is one of now seven programs in the Cyber Policy Center dealing with all kinds of issues of trust and safety online, uh, disinformation, um, hate speech, um, um, First Amendment free speech rights online. Uh, as well as uh, much else. And I should say that every Tuesday starting October 3rd, we'll be having our weekly uh, lunches in the Mogadam Conference Room here on the Stanford campus. But you can also, to the millions who are watching live right now, you can also join uh, uh, by Zoom. Um, I, want, I will introduce our speakers, but I want to start by turning the mic over to our, our partner in all of this, which is uh, uh, Constance Deleuze uh, from Project Liberty's McCourt Institute. She is in Paris uh, and will be joining us uh, by Zoom, and so I want to make sure that we have uh, this all set up for her. Constance, can you hear us? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. And good morning to everyone at uh, Stanford. Good afternoon and good, uh, good evening to everyone online. I'm pleased to kick off this event on ensuring responsible AI innovation, a joint effort by the Stanford Cyber Policy Center and Project Liberties Institute. Today, 82% of Americans are more concerned than excited about the increased use of AI. Where does this concern come from? What can policymakers, academics, and industry actors do to address this issue? Project Liberties Institute is an international nonprofit organization mobilizing a global alliance of technologists, academics, policymakers, and citizens to build a more responsible approach to innovation. Our three foundational partners include Sciences Po in Paris. Georgetown, and of course, Stanford. Today, our star panelists will discuss the different regulatory approaches that the US and the EU have taken. We will see that many lessons can be learned from this comparative analysis. The EU has taken a centralized approach to AI regulation. It has also taken a risk-based approach. A clear example of this is the EU AI Act. The US has also uh, taken an approach, but it's more decentralized and industry self-regulation plays a much stronger role. Both approaches come along with challenges. The EU Act can help harmonize innovation across the block. At the same time, questions remain on how this legislation can be practically implemented in each country. The US, on the other hand, may face issues of fragmentation in the development and deployment of AI systems. Finally, we also face the risk of transatlantic regulatory incoherence, given the different approaches between the US and the EU. It's clear that AI will continue to transform the way we live, we work, and we play every day. But concerns about the misuse of AI remain. At Project Liberties Institute, our mission is to support scholars, industry actors, and policymakers who are committed to working on these issues. For example, Spain has taken the lead, dedicating resources to establishing the first EU national agency for the supervision of AI. This is a great example of what can be done very concretely. And we are pleased and honored to have with us today Her Excellency, Carmen Artigas, which we thank along with our colleagues from Stanford. And with that, I'm pleased to hand it over to you, Nate. Thank you so much. 
so much. Uh, and Constance, we look forward to you coming uh, soon to Stanford as well as uh, the whole Project Liberty team. Um, I want to invite uh, uh, and, and introduce uh, Carme Atigas, the, Secretary, the Spanish Secretary of State for Digitalization and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, she's a recognized expert in big data, artificial intelligence, and technology innovation, uh, with more than 25 years of experience uh, in the technology sector. Um, she co-founded and was the CEO of Synergic uh, Partners, a pioneering uh, European big data company, uh, which was acquired by Telefonica Group in, in November 2015, which she also uh, then worked for. She continued serving as company CEO until the company's full integration into the Telefonica Group at the end of 2018. Obviously, with Spain uh, having the presidency of the EU, uh, it couldn't sort of come at a more propitious time for us here at Stanford and we in Silicon Valley to have the opportunity to hear from Secretary Artigas. Um, she will give a few uh, remarks at the beginning and then we'll have uh, a panel uh, discussion uh, that follows. So Secretary Artigas, welcome to Stanford and thank you so much for joining us. So good morning to everyone. Thank you very much. I'm, it is a pleasure for me to be here at Stanford University to participate in this great panel and discussing about AI governance paradigms and contribute to this rich debate from not only the European vision, but also the national Spanish vision. And thank you very much, Project Liberty, Constance, and the Sabbath uh, Policy Center, uh, Paul Fellinger, Mariette Schacke, uh, Mr. Persley, and all, all the Sabbath Policy Center at Stanford for organizing this, this event. And thank you, all of you, uh, on presence and online for joining this inaugural event. I would like to just summarize what we have done from from national perspective, and I would say that uh, this this discussion is more timely than ever. Eh? But we have been working on this for the last three years. Over the last three years, we were not only concerned about the, the, the potential harmful uses of artificial intelligence and other technologies such as quantum computing, neurotech, or even synthetic biology, but uh, before uh, going through the regulation piece, we had an internal, very important discussion at the national level on the digital uh, rights. So already in 2020, uh, we launched the Charter of Digital Rights, which was a way to transpone the existing rights we have in the offline world. How should we reinterpret the, those on the digital world? How do we reinterpret the right of free speech, the right not to be discriminated? I would extend ironic comment in Twitter becomes a real threat in real life. And that discussion led us to discover that it was not only necessary to transform or reinterpret the existing civil rights that we had on the offline world, but the digital world required that we even propose new digital rights that didn't exist before because those threats were not existing before. In particular, we made uh, two special chapters on rights uh, related to AI, like the right not to be discriminated by an algorithm, the right for algorithm transparency between the, the, the relation between companies and employers, Spain becoming the first country putting this into a law, we call it the rider's law, the law that regulates the gig economy. We have the concept of algorithm transparency. At what extent Spain is hosting the uh, Center for the European Commission on Algorithm Transparency uh, in Seville. That is a concept that will be developed in the DSA, in the Digital Services Act. And also another right we ask in the AI uh, uh, environment was, for example, the right of a second human opinion. When some automated decision discriminates me or prevents me from having an insurance or a medical treatment. We went even far and we made a specific focus on neurotech and neurotechnologies. For example, the right not to be augmented by a device or not to be augmented by any chip, and also the right not to be influenced in your free will. And that's something that also has a lot of uh, uh, connections with misinformation, because as you know, that is an absolute right, not a relative right. The right of free speech is a relative right, because my free speech finishes when yours starts. But the right of having an opinion is an absolute right. So all these discussions led us to, to be very vocal on the fact that regulation must be based on rights doesn't need to be based on principles or on, I would say, um, ethics. That's nice to have. That's desirable. But when you regulate, you need to relate based on rights because rights generate guarantees and rights 
require accountability by governments and institutions. And this is why everything that comes after is based on this vision of this Charter of Digital Rights. In fact, this Charter of Digital Rights inspired the European Union in the European Declaration of Digital Rights and Principles last year. And also, at the OECD level, we organized the ministerial meeting on digital economy in December 2022 in Canary Islands. And then we also uh, achieved uh, a declaration uh, in, in uh, assigning to the OECD uh, a recommendation on preserving rights in the digital age. Earlier this year, we also signed an Iberoamerican American Charter on Digital Principles and Rights, where we joined more than 34 countries in Latin America and Caribbean, joining these principles. Very important, they were focusing more even than us on access to digital education and also the uh, compatibility with technology development and sustainability. So uh, as we were this charter, we also realized that we may have to start thinking about the need to claim new rights, uh, as I mentioned, on the new uh, emerging technologies. And this is the great challenge we have as democratic countries, how to empower individuals uh, to make creators of digital future and maintain human agency in anything we develop from now on. We have been very following very closely from Spain the work that you have done at Stanford, both from the Cyber um, uh, Policy Center and also from the High Institute. And in, fi in fact, the High Institute is inspiring us a lot in, in different areas. Uh, in particular, the High AI Index is something that we look after and, and, and I think it's the first one that is measuring the progress of AI in the world. And uh, Spain is, is uh, very well positioned there. It's, it's in position eight overall, having uh, called Spain a rising star. But we are number one, we're the leading country in the world in the development and implementation of AI policies and regulation. In the 23 report, Spain actually ranks first among the countries with the highest number of legislative proceedings containing mentions to AI, 273 only in 2022. So this is really already uh, has, has permutated any legislation we have in place. Remember that Spain was the first country in the world having the, the national law for data privacy, um, LOPD, Ley Organica de Datos, that inspired the GDPR. We were, have been the first one incorporating agreeing transparency in a law. And we are the first country in the world now having a national agency of supervision of AI. So let me explain how we are committed on AI from Spain. We launched our national strategy in 2020. And uh, that uh, was funded by uh, about 3 billion euro public private investment with initial public investment of 600 million euros, which according to the size of Spain is huge. And uh, beside the ethical framework, we, have, uh, we are investing a lot in reaching excellence on at the academy level, in integrated AI in the industry, thinking also by small and medium businesses. And for example, we have financed five light, uh, uh, lighthouse projects on uh, precision medicine and sustainability, uh, uh, agro-food, age-related diseases, we also have awarded 100 million euros in subsidies for a small and medium businesses to integrate mature AI in the value chain for optimization of processes and efficiency gains. And we have two important uh, uh, particular, particular programs that I would like to share because it has to do with the discussion we have today. One is the National Plan for Green Algorithms. We're the first country naming this word, green algorithms. Because we were seeing that, for example, current, lang current lang language models are very inefficient from the energetic consumption point of view. And we think that the future development must be green by design. So I wouldn't expect to have a GPT-5 that, is, that doesn't reduce significantly the energy consumption of GPT-4. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Because that will, that then, probably the AI will compete with the human beings on energy resources. So we have to choose, we dedicate this amount of energy to heat our homes or to process this algorithm. And it makes no sense. So we uh, have this uh, quality seal for green tech that we're starting to measure the tech. That affects, for example, blockchain also. So uh, we have measured that the uh, consumption of putting a block in the blockchain, it's the same amount of CO2 emissions than a flight between Madrid and London. One block. And if we're not measuring this, we are not starting measuring the environmental impact of our technology development, that will be a, a, a zero gain. And I think that's important to have a focus now, exactly at the point of time we are in, and decide where do we, where, where do we devote the resources to. 
We are also integrating artificial intelligence in, 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 um, in AI in, in, the, in the chairs of our in universities. We have like 16 chairs on AI, 16 chairs on cybersecurity. We are linking a lot both. I'm, I'm the president of the National Center for Cybersecurity in Spain, the CYBOL approach. And we see more and more this relationship between AI and cybersecurity in both senses. No? Uh, also in the AI safety, which is something that, that is uh, worrying us very much. And an important uh, uh, thing that we are focusing on is on language, but in a Spanish language. Because we have launched a national plan on, on uh, AI in Spanish, so we pretend to have a corpus of training data for uh, large language models and, and uh, speech recognition and uh, uh, personal assistance in Spanish language. Because all AI is developed in, in, in English or in Chinese. And we have 600 million uh, speakers. And behind uh, language, it is not only a transactional tool for communication. It's a map of the world. It's a vision of the values. Uh, I always put a very interesting example, which is true. If you tell Alexa in English, Alexa, I'm sad, probably they will say, oh, I would give you a hug if you, in English if you have that. That's, that's a test somebody did. Then they made the same question in Russian. They say, Alexa, I'm sad in Russian. And Alexa answered, I never told you life was easy. <laughs> no? Probably we say in Spanish, I'm sad. Alexa should answer, OK, by no way you stay at home. Let's go party. Because that's what you would say. And that's important we, we bear in mind this, especially when we are thinking or projecting ourselves in a society when we will all live more than 90 years old, probably we'll be living alone, probably we'll rely on our, our, our voice assistants to have access to social benefits of medicine, and that voice will be deteriorated, will be different access, will be, and I think it's important that we also don't think that we should standardize uh, language recognition through these models uh, uh, without taking into account all these particularities. So we are very concerned on that, and I think also there's a, why not, a competitive advantage in, in that as a country or as a, as a continent. Then uh, another area we're putting the focus on is on neurotechnologies. We're going to launch the first uh, R&D center, well, it's, it's a research center called the Spain Neurotech, Gathering brilliant minds as partners that are in the US, Professor Rafa Houston, Columbia University, Professor Alvaro Pascual Leone in Harvard Medical School, uh, Professor um, Carmena from uh, Berkeley. So, join the first uh, development center of neurotechnologies, but with an ethics perspective. Because we consider that, I mean, if we look at the potential harm that neurotechnologies can do just with a simple device, which is not regulated, we can really think that disinformation and fake news will be a joke. I would be listening to music and I could be just, you know, injected some electric pulse that makes me buy this at Amazon or vote this party. So we want to develop all the potential that neurotechnology has for curing Alzheimer, for example, but uh, preventing that from, from the beginning with an ethical perspective. And now we hold the presidency of the European Union, and, and it cannot be a more convenient time. We are holding it from July until December, and among all the different uh, legislative portfolio we are, we are leading, uh, the, the, the previous presidency on, on Sweden finished the, the Data Act, which regulates also data marketplaces, uh, IoT-generated data, and also some uh, limitations on computing um, uh, capacity on, on, on private data. But the, the really hot topic here is the AI Act. And we have already started the process called trilogues. And trilogues means that the initial proposal from the commission is a version. Then you have a position of the a member states, which is the council. And then the parliament has another position representing the citizens. And these positions, in some cases, are coincident. And in some particular cases, are still very far. And our role is really to, to, to find the, the, the trade-off and the consensus of these three uh, versions. And this is why this information is so important for me because uh, I'm in the right place at the right time for you and the industry share with us the concerns on the future regulation and really uh, make it a good balance so that regulation does not hamper innovation. Uh, I think that is the topic of the, of the session today. So we're very, very uh, glad to participate in the discussion. And just mentioning, as I, as I said, that the Spain will not only be the first country in the world, which is already having a national agency for supervision on AI, but we are leading the European AI sandbox. So at this moment, we are already putting in place a sandbox. So we're inviting the industry to, and the academia to participate 
in the feature modeling of the regulation. So before the regulation is in place, we want to talk about the industry and how to make it operative. Because otherwise what happens in Europe, and Mr. De Graaf knows, knows it well, we have very good intentions, then we launch the legislation, we give a two years adaptation time, the SMBs suffer a lot, instead of hiring uh, data science, they need to hire lawyers, and as I say, joking uh, in-house, I say the next unicorn in Europe will be a legal tech company, because we need AI to really deal with, uh, deal with uh, all the complex uh, legislation we've built. But uh, this is the pros and cons that all these all this situations I just uh, to finish, I believe that we have the leadership. I think Spain has a leadership, Europe has a leadership, and can be the vocal actor in, in making the, the, the industry and also the governments uh, uh, conscious that we need to regulate AI. But we need to regulate it at a global level. It's the same. If I'm not polluting the environment, but France is, I will still be breathing the same polluted air. So we really need to find a consensus, and next uh, week, as you know, is the UNGA, the General Assembly of the United Nations, where I'll be very um, participating in several panels, but also the president of the government of Spain, uh, Pedro Sánchez, is leading himself the, the initiative to, to uh, work with the UN and, and other uh, countries in making that possible. So thank you very much for your attention and for this panel, thank you. Wonderful. So now we'll have uh, some additional remarks and, and responses, uh, and we, we, we've sort of divided this up, uh, I, I guess, in the transatlantic sense. We're starting in Europe, and we're going to end up here in California. And so, um, although I'm next to speak is uh, Gerard de Graaf, who uh, is here now and, and bridging the divide as the um, uh, council in um, uh, here in, in well, uh, working here in the consul in uh, San Francisco. But uh, Gerard de Graaf has worked for more than 30 years in the European Commission across a wide range of policy areas. And until his recent appointment, he was director of uh, DG Connect, which is responsible for the Digital Services and Digital Markets Act. Uh, previously, he was responsible for the EU's telecommunications and audiovisual policy, cybersecurity, ICT standardization, uh, and, and a host of other um, uh, areas dealing with technology in Europe. He's been co-chairing two of the Trade and Technology Council working groups on green tech and on data governance and technology platforms. Uh, prior to joining DG Connect, uh, he was in the DG Research and Innovation and DG Internal Market. Um, and from 1997 to 2001, he was the trade counselor at the European Commission's delegation to the United States uh, in Washington, D.C. And now we are thrilled to have him local here in California. And he's been a frequent uh, attendee at a lot of uh, these events that we do here at Stanford and elsewhere. So, Gerard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Nate. And really credit to your leadership and the leadership of Stanford in these complicated uh, areas. I mean, if they were simple, we would probably not need so many of these discussions, but the developments go so fast uh, and they uh, raise so uh, important policy issues that we need all the expertise we can get. And I think Stanford has been absolutely excellent in sharing expertise with us. Uh, I'm also tremendously honored to speak after Spanish State Secretary Carmen Artiga. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I think we can all be very pleased uh, that the presidency is in such good hands uh, because there is, I mean, in, in the terms of the legislative cycle, I mean, it's Spain comes a bit last before we have our European Parliament elections next June and then the next commission. So Spain's task is to, to clear the table, to get all of the proposals which are still outstanding and obviously the AI Act being uh, one of them and a very important one of them to get them across the finishing line. And, I mean, I think with the experience and the expertise of the State Secretary, we can be very, very confident. L let me just, because I have only five minutes and I used up already probably a minute and a half, so I'm going to be very quick here. There were two quite important events this week, one in Europe, in Strasbourg, and the other one in Washington, D.C. In Europe, we had the State of the Union. President von der Leyen once a year presents the State of the Union like President Biden does to the Congress once a year. And she spoke quite extensively about many issues, of course, I mean, Ukraine and, and all the ch challenges that Europe is facing. But, but she spoke also extensively about digital and she spoke extensively about AI. And she underlined three things. Is one, we need the guardrails in place. We've actually borrowed this word from the US. I mean, nobody ever used guardrails in another context in the EU than like highways. 
That's why we have guardrails. Now everybody in the European Union is talking about guardrails in the sense of safeguards. So we need guardrails, that's the AI Act. We need governance, which is global. I mean, it's not enough for the European Union to have like a framework in place. We need global rules, we need global convergence. And third, what we need is innovation. I really want to emphasize that. We, we, Europe doesn't just want to be a regulatory superpower. We want to be also a technology superpower. In many ways, we are already a technology superpower. In AI, we want to be a big player. And one of the things that, for example, the president announced this week, and I know it's something that will, I think, find favor also here with Stanford, is that we need to make capabilities available to small businesses, startup businesses, academia, in order to be able to also be successful players for the development of large language models because you need so much compute, you need so much kind of cloud capacity. If, if you do not kind of democratize this, if you don't make that more widely available, you will end up with a very limited number of players who have actually the resources to, to develop these large language models. So we are going to open up our supercomputing capacities in the European Union. We have Euro HPC, high performance computing, to the startup and the, and the SME community. I think that's important. On the governance side, I mean, the, the EU is playing on different chessboards. We have, of course, our own chessboard we're playing, and we're confident that before the end of the year we'll have a good result. But also internationally, the European Union, together with the US, wants to be a leader. And, and the president uh, uh, proposed this week uh, a kind of uh, equivalent of what we have in climate change, um, the, uh, a body of very, very wise people that can come together and, and provide profound advice to policymakers, to kind of uh, decision makers around the world, how to approach these these issues. Because there is there's so much. I mean, it's it's so complicated. These issues. We need the best minds, and several of the best minds are here in this room, and, and certainly on this campus to to help us find the right solution. So that was one important event, the State of the Union. The other important event took place in Washington D.C., where. Senator Ch Schumer kind of, I think he um, invited uh, 60 senators and then industry and civil society and leadership from labor unions to come and converse and discuss further on AI and how to, to tackle this. And I think that's important. And it was, I think, one of the points that were, were communicated. It was a closed door meeting. One of the points that was communicated during that session is that all leaders agreed that AI should be regulated, but there was kind of quite different views about how that regulation should look like. But I saw a very small excerpt on CNN where one of, say, the attendees was interviewed, I think from the Organization for Civil Rights, and she said, yes, all agreed, and so Musk's hand went up and Zuckerberg's hand went up, and then somebody said, and I don't know who it was, said, but don't regulate like the EU. So let's regulate, but don't regulate like the EU. And I, I, mean, I don't know whether this was, I, don't, I suspect this was maybe not the best informed comment that was made during this, uh, this session, but again, it was closed door, so I, 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 cannot, I cannot judge. But I think it's maybe useful to go a little bit back to basic. I think as the State Secretary said, this was not something that the EU developed overnight. I mean, you can actually go back to 2017, 2018, when we set up an expert group, we developed a white paper, we had massive um, uh, expertise, I mean, working sessions, work uh, kind of seminars we, we, we did, of course, as we always do, wide, the widest in the world public consultation. We do a very detailed impact assessment, and now we've been negotiating for more than two years in the Council and the Parliament on this text. So nobody can argue that this is like a rush job. Here's the EU and they see AI and just let's put something on the table and let's get it adopted. But maybe just to go back, how is the EU regulating AI? I think it's an important question. We're regulating it from a values perspective. We want AI to support our values. It's, this is AI for our societies, for people, for our communities. It's not, we are not going to adjust to AI. AI will have to adjust to, to us, how we live in the European Union. So it's values-based. It's also risk-based. Uh, so we're not looking. People sometimes give the impression that we try to regulate every piece of AI. No, we're not. We're going to regulate AI in particular <coughs> use cases where there are risks, risk where of bias, of discrimination, lack of transparency, etc. Uh, nobody has ever quantified how many cases, I mean, how much that is of the total kind of AI offer, probably not more than 10 or 15 percent. So like, a lot of AI that kind of we use in our lives, it's not going to be affected 
in a meaningful way by the AI Act. So I think that's important to, to note. And the third point, this is product safety based. I mean, we have a long tradition in the European Union of regulating the safety of products, as you have in this country. We want people to feel safe when they drive a car, when they use a piece of equipment, when they take medication, etc. So we follow that approach. So it's a, it's a risk-based uh, approach, product safety approach. So this means that in many, many cases, industry will be able to self-declare. Uh, there's what we call in conformity assessment in the European Union. Maybe sometimes you have seen a box from the EU and it has this CE mark on it. That's what product safety is about. In the large majority of cases, it's actually manufacturers or, or distributors of product self-declaring. I meet the standards because typically what will now need to happen is that standards will need to be developed, of course, by industry. In the standards setting is an industry-led process. And then in the majority of cases, the manufacturers will self-declare. And of course, if there's mistakes, then they'll be found out and there'll be consequences. And so you can't just make things up. And in a limited number of cases, again, on the risk-based, there'll be a third party that comes in and do a, uh, does a, an external certification. So that's the way we work in the European Union, also because many of the, the AI we're talking about will actually be integrated into devices. Uh, we can't just talk only about large language models and AI. I mean, medical equipment will be effectively AI uh, monitored, I mean, AI kind of driven uh, equipment. So that's the last point maybe on, on our approach is, is an internal market approach. Because uh, the member states can be quite active in our space to regulate. If, if we leave a void at the European Union level, member states will fill that void. I mean, I talk from experience with the DSA and the, the DMA, and, and, and we see the same in AI. So th this is also, we can provide a legal framework across the European Union that is a single legal framework. framework. So one set of rules. If, again, if you're a manufacturer, if you're a user, you know you're going to be equally well protected, irrespective of where you live in the European Union. If you're a manufacturer, you have access to the full size of the single market, which is the largest single market in the world, 450 million users. So that's a tremendous advantage. I sometimes worry about this country, and I see some evidence of this, that if the federal government leaves that void, states will fill it. I mean, I see a bit the reverse. What, I mean, we are starting from a fragmented market try to make a single market. This is the journey that the European Union is on. That's one of the drivers behind a lot of the legislative proposals that are going through the Council and the Parliament. In this country, you have, you have, or maybe I should say you had, a single market, and now you see to take, take data protection. This, this state, this great state of California, copied very largely the GDPR. Washington State copied, Colorado copied, Virginia copied, Connecticut copied, copied many more, about 14, 15 states, all in slightly different ways. So now when I talk to industry, they're saying, ooh, doing business in the US is more complicated because we need to kind of combine all of the different legal standards and sometimes we need to adjust and it's all going to, it, it adds complexity. So this is interesting that we're on our journey to a single market and if the US kind of leaves a vacuum, at least at the federal level, you might find yourself one day with a fragmented market, and, and that is not a good thing. Last, my last point, because I'm going over time. I mean, this is important to talk about regulation, but I think the State Secretary said, uh, you know, quite rightly, highlighted other issues. We also, as a society, as like policy makers, I mean, collectively, we need to get our heads around. Energy use, an important one. Impacts on the labor market. Mm -hmm. I think most of us, and, and I talk also here, you know, when I look at the statistic, statistics of companies in the European Union, about like 10, 15 percent of companies are actually actively looking at integrating AI in their business models. I mean, many organizations are woefully unprepared for the kind of changes that are kind of really around the corner, literally are around the corner. Our societies are unprepared. Equality, inclusion, I mean, the global south, um, issues kind of around our, our, our national kind of cultures. I mean, most of these large language models are English-based. I mean, we have more than 23, I mean, 24 official languages in the European Union. We want large language models that can also work on Spanish together with like the, the global Spanish speaking community. We mean a good example, Sweden and Norway and Denmark have developed with the public support 
a large language model for the Scandinavian languages, because that's otherwise it's not going to be served. The private sector has no interest in serving these markets because they're not big enough. And I think that maybe comes to my last point, and I know it's also a point very close to Stanford's heart, is the ecosystem. At the moment, the ecosystem is almost exclusively private sector driven. We must have a much more balanced ecosystem where it's yeah, private sector driven and big private sector, big tech driven. We need to have a much more balance between the academics need to be involved in this, the public sector needs to be involved in this, so we need to invest. We need to create the opportunities for that ecosystem to become more balanced. I leave it at that. Thank you. I, I always like to end it on a clarion call for more academic involvement. That's, you know, for those of us uh, uh, who are professors, we, yes, I appreciate it. Um, I'll say for the rest of the speakers, if you want to just sit at your chair, that's fine. It's up to you. But um, next to, to speak is, I will say, our own Florence uh, Giselle. Uh, I say our own because she's now just recently uh, joined Stanford. Uh, she is a professor of private law at the University of Lorraine and leads the Digital Governance and Sovereignty Chair at Sciences Po. Um, and so she is the embodiment of this partnership that Constance uh, Deleuze was mentioning before, which is uh, this bridge that's being connected through this Project Liberty Institute between us, uh, Sciences Po, and uh, Georgetown. Uh, she's currently um, leading our new program here uh, in the Cyber Policy Center on Governance of Emerging Technologies. Um, which, as I mentioned before, is not only about generative AI, but also other technologies. And so uh, keep an eye out for the reports that she is um, helping produce that we hope to get done by the end of the year, which will be on governance of generative AI, and as I mentioned before, governance of blockchain, governance uh, virtual reality. So uh, Florence, welcome to Stanford, and thanks so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I must say that I'm very honored to uh, be given the opportunity uh, to speak after uh, Secretary of State uh, Kame Artigas and Gerard, uh, Gerard de Graaf. Uh, uh, it's an honor for me. I will speak not, not on the behalf of the EU, of course, but as a European scholar and as a European scholar that is given, gi being given the opportunity to be here, to spend time here at Stanford. And it's a very rich and, and fruitful experience for me because I have the opportunity to engage in conversations with colleagues from every discipline. So I will be brief and I will um, make only a few remarks. Um, I would like to, to take a step back and um, just to say a few words about what the role of a regulator can be in the face of emerging technologies. And when I say emerging technologies, I say technologies that bring something new to the table, but also technologies that raise new risks, and, and new, risks, new risks that we don't know, and that will evolve over time, and that will appear over time. And I would say very simply that we have two possibilities. The first possibility is, to say, is just to say we, as a regulator, as regulators, we don't, we don't do anything. We adopt a hands-off stance, we step back, we let the private sector take the reins, um, um, we give the private sector the freedom to explore all the available avenues the technology, technologies have to offer, and engage, if needed, in self-regulation. Of course, this approach uh, uh, raise, raises significant risks, and there is another alternative, which is to say, okay, we are facing new innovations, and we want to regulate now. We don't want to wait, because we want those technologies to develop while respecting values, while respecting important principles, while respecting fundamental rights. And of course, it's the, the path that has been chosen by Europe. It's a choice um, um, that is understandable. It's a choice that has its challenges. It's not, of course, an easy task. We know that the pace of innovation um, um, races forward at high speed, so, and it's, it's written in the current draft of the EU AI Act that, that it will evolve over time, and so, so the, the regulators will have to adapt over time. So 
and my last remarks about this um, is to highlight, I think, two important objectives um, uh, that we should keep in mind. First, I think, I would say clarity. We, we already have existing regulations in Europe. We have the GDPR. We have, for example, um, the DSM copyright directive. And, and we have, of course, to make sure that those regulations are understood, that we do not need any legal tech to really understand how they apply to those new innovations that we are witn witnessing. And we want, want, of course, to have new regulations that can be well understood in um, uh, regard to those previous um, um, uh, regulations. And of course, we want new provisions to be clear. For example, and I, will I would mention the example of um, the provisions that define large language models. We, we, in, the, in the first draft of the EU uh, AI Act, there was no mention of generative AI of, or, or of uh, general purpose AI. So the Council in, in introduced the notion of general purpose AI. And today we have a draft from the Parliament that defines foundation models, that defines generative uh, AI tools. And of course, we need those definitions to be as clear as possible because we will have to apply them and, and there will be enforcement um, uh, questions. So this is my first remark, the need for clarity. And my second remark would, say, would be to highlight the need to find the right balance between um, the protection of fundamental rights and the need to foster innovation. Because we know that the big players can, uh, of course, bear the, the, the compliance costs. Uh, but we don't want to prevent small players from developing. And so we, we need to find the way to um, make small players, uh, um, uh, to, to give them the possibility to develop uh, uh, res while respecting fundamental rights, of course, but we don't want to prevent them from um, uh, developing sophisticated tools and be competitive. So I will, I will um, uh, stop here and I, I welcome any um, uh, further conversations that we might have. Thank you very much. Even though uh, I think five of, the, of those of us on the, on the panel are, are currently in the United States, we now turn to the American uh, uh, scholars. Uh, 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 my colleague, Dan Ho, from the law school, he is uh, the William Benjamin Scott and Luna Scott Professor of Law here at Stanford and also Professor of Political Science, Senior Fellow at CEPR. Uh, Associate Director of the Stanford In Institute for Human-Centered AI, uh, and Director of what's known as the Reg Lab, the Regulation, Evaluation, and Governance Lab. But he also serves on the National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Commission, advising the White House on a AI policy, and Senior Advisor on Responsible AI at the Department of Labor, on the Committee on uh, National Statistics of the National uh, Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and is public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States. Thank you, Dan. Uh, eager to hear what you have to say. Uh, well, thanks so much for, for that introduction. I'm just uh, honored to engage in this conversation with uh, uh, this uh, really incredible panel. I want to thank Nate and the Cyber Policy Center for putting on this event, uh, Constance and, and Project Liberty for really organizing, helping to organize this, and, and the Secretary of State for uh, taking the time to visit uh, uh, Stanford here. Uh, Nate asked me to provide a few remarks about the state of the US regulatory approach to AI. And when I was collecting my thoughts for this event, it seemed a little daunting to try to summarize everything that's going on on AI governance in the US in just a few minutes. Then again, one perspective is that not that much has actually been enacted, so maybe I should just <laughs> yield my time uh, to, to Dave uh, uh, to, to go next. But let me uh, uh, kind of uh, say maybe four trends and four takeaways for what is happening in the US in this current moment. The sort of baseline as already alluded to by uh, uh, numerous of the, the panelists, is that we've had a somewhat sectoral-based approach where FDA continues to regulate AI medical devices. It's approved 500 such devices. Department of Transportation uh, regulates self-driving cars. We've had states enter the, the mix in certain ways, like the California Data uh, uh, Privacy uh, sort of act. Um, and a kind of a set of voluntary uh, uh, provisions like the 
National Institute for Standards and Technology AI risk management framework uh, that can be voluntarily adopted and has been quite important to the U.S. approach. But let me spell out four trends of what's really happening uh, currently and then four kind of takeaways really to kick off the discussion of this panel. The first is uh, that since the beginning of this calendar year, we've seen a major push really sparked uh, by generative AI. Uh, Congress has had its kind of chat GPT moment, uh, leading to a huge amount of attention on Capitol Hill. Uh, Senator Schumer introducing a kind of very high level safe innovation framework. Uh, just a few days ago, Senators Blumenthal and Hawley called for an independent oversight body for licensing foundation models or high risk uses. And there, much of the conversation has been about a range of different interventions, such as licensing, registration of large uh, language models uh, or foundation models, auditing, shifting around liability, and forms of disclosure. The second uh, trend is that we've seen much more concrete headway in terms of actual enactments uh, when it comes to the public sector. Uh, so Senator Peters in particular has been quite successful at pushing forward legislative initiatives like the AI and Government Act, uh, the AI Training Act, that call for the creation, for instance, of AI hiring lines within the federal government, the training of procurement officials, and then recently uh, the AI Lead Act, uh, which calls for chief AI officers within federal agencies, uh, uh, was uh, voted out of uh, committee. Third trend is that we've seen uh, successful efforts really trying to push forward on the investment in R&D side. Uh, so we've seen, uh, I think, around $250 billion uh, sort of uh, uh, under the CHIPS Act to fund uh, sort of semiconductor manufacturing and R&D uh, activity in the space. And then uh, an initiative that was championed actually by Stanford High is the National AI Research Resource, which I think is very much in the spirit of trying to level the playing field of who is able to participate in AI innovation uh, by providing uh, compute and data access uh, to many more individuals, where right now the capacity to train one of these models resides in a very small number of industry players and to a much lesser extent, a small number of universities. And that has also now uh, been introduced in a bipartisan way under the CREATE AI Act. Fourth trend is that we've seen more happen by way of executive action simply because it's much easier to push things through executive orders. So we've seen executive orders that have required all federal agencies to file AI use case inventories, a kind of classic transparency initiative. Uh, the Biden administration also for the first time in executive order defined algorithmic discrimination and mandated that agencies consider how to actually combat forms of algorithmic discrimination. A uh, number of weeks ago, we saw the announcement of a set of voluntary commitments that was orchestrated through uh, the White House involving uh, safety, uh, uh, testing, red teaming, and information sharing about emergent risks. And we're going to see a long-awaited executive order uh, that is expected uh, uh, pretty soon. So those are kind of the four trends in terms of the U.S. landscape that I see. I'll give you four brief takeaways that hopefully will kick off this panel discussion. One is uh, something I already mentioned, which is we've seen a major shift in the pace of discussion since January, since Congress has had its chat GPT moment. The second is that in part because so many policymakers are catching up on the technology, we've seen introduced very high level frameworks that exhibit very little uh, agreement about some basic questions as to what the core harms are that we're trying to address. How much should we be anchoring about near-term risks versus speculative long-term risks? There are tensions between uh, a, a, a set of the enumerated uh, values, like uh, how do you address privacy and bias when the two can actually be in tension with one another? Uh, how do you address uh, basic tensions between uh, trying to reduce the openness of the innovation ecosystem if you're anchoring against existential risk, whereas you might want to uh, accelerate uh, innovation if you're really focused on the geopolitical comp competitive uh, aspect. Third uh, is that in part because we've seen such high-level uh, frameworks, I think one uh, sort of thing I'd be curious to dive into, particularly in comparison with the EU, is this very real possibility of serious under-enforcement of these uh, high-level uh, commitments. Where is the technical capacity going to be to make risk assessments? 
uh, and determinations? Who is going to follow up on registrations and actually monitor for unregistered use? Where's the audit capacity, given that so much of the technical expertise right now does not reside in the public sector? Um, and how do we really grapple with that stark divergence between private and public sector capacity? Fourth, and this is the last thing that I worry about, particularly in the US context, is that I think what's in part because we've been so much more successful at pushing forward uh, enforceable commitments on the public sector, one of the worries is that the current Congress may actually replicate what I would describe as the original sin of the Privacy Act of 1974, which is the Privacy Act of 1974 came about at a time when we were worried about a national surveillance system of records in light of Watergate. And what did Congress do? It reached those actors that it could reach immediately, which was agencies. And so agencies, federal agencies, act under a data minimization principle since 1974, but it never reached any uh, private actors through the Privacy Act. And the same dynamic may be occurring in the AI space, where it's a heck of a lot easier to mandate chief AI officers, certain forms of testing, algorithmic impact assessments, and the like, mm -hmm. on the public sector. And it's a lot harder to figure out how to get that right on the private sector, which I think could actually replicate many of the woes that occurred on the data privacy side uh, after 1974 in the U.S. context. Thank that, you. I will so we now turn to Dave Wilner, uh, who recently left OpenAI as the head of trust and safety. Uh, he left them to come here. And so welcome also to you, uh, Dave. He was the uh, inaugural fellow in our new uh, program on governance of emerging technologies. Uh, I should say that though his, he's uh, He's kind of had a, um, uh, I guess, a, a kind of world series of jobs here in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, he's seen it all, uh, starting at Facebook in 2008, uh, where, among other things, he helped users reset their passwords. Um, uh, but then uh, worked there on, on joining the original team of moderators, writing Facebook's first systematic content policies, and built the team that uh, maintains those rules to this day. Um, and then, after going uh, with other, some other startups, then worked at, at Airbnb for uh, a time before uh, coming to OpenAI. And so there, there are, every time I, I talk to Dave Wilner, I learn something about um, this industry and this technology. And so I'm thrilled to welcome you here uh, to Stanford and, and to hear your remarks today. Of course. Um, is this on? Yes. Great. Um, so first, thanks for having me. It's, it's uh, surprising and delightful to be in a room like this and on a panel like this. It's not something I ever expected to end up doing with my life. Um, also, sorry about how all of the content policy turned out. We were, we were trying, <laughs> uh, but some of the results were, I think, mixed. Um, Can you still get my password changed? No, 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 that's much, much more secure uh, than when it was my job. Um, I, as Nate sort of alluded to, my job in a lot of ways has been over the last 15 years figuring out, okay, we have these emerging technologies, they create new risks. What are we gonna do about the risks they create right right now? Not in the sort of long-term way necessarily, not in the global way, but what can we actually do to sort of intervene here? And that that was the role I very much took on for OpenAI. Worth grounding that OpenAI was started very much out of a concern around safety, more on the sort of existential risk side. And so I absolutely was not running all of the safety efforts, and it is something that a lot of different people within the company think about extensively. My piece of this was dealing with people actually using the technology where it encountered the public, either developers or folks directly through uh, ChatGPT. Um, and, and in that context, it was a very interesting place to be because there was very much a desire uh, to do safety responsibly and be believed in doing that. And we do not live in a world where people believe technology companies when they say, trust us, we're doing everything we can to make things safe anymore. And some of the desire that you're seeing from industry here for self, for external assurance, whether that is regulation exactly or external auditing, even if that involves in a more self-regulatory mode, comes out of a knowledge that, A, we want these things to be safe. We want a bar for what safe enough means. And the companies need some ability to prove to the public that they have reached that bar. Um, and I think that has motivated a lot of the request for regulation that you've seen from industry, which I know surprised everybody a little bit. Um, because there is this knowledge that 
us saying, hey, we spent six months doing safety for GPT-4, and here's all of these reports that we wrote that say, don't worry about it, it's totally fine, uh, isn't good enough in the current environment we're in. So, so one thing I would say is that the White House commitments in particular do seem like a very important and useful immediate step towards establishing that way of uh, showing that industry efforts are, are safe enough. Um, the other sort of thing I'd note is that we have a very uneven handle on how to do safety for AI, depending on how closed versus open the systems are. So for the closed source systems provided directly to users like BARD um, or ChatGPT, I'm not going to say like everything is fine and there's nothing to do, but there is a reasonably decent plan there, right? You can do safety at the model level to train the model not to create kinds of content that you don't want it to create. And then you can do monitoring on top of users' access to that and combine those things. We have some sense of traction of how to actually keep ChatGPT from being just wildly horrible. Um, and that will continue to improve. Uh, the more open a system gets, the less of a good handle we have on it today. Maybe that'll change, but it, it seems difficult. So for the APIs where developers are embedding models and then building things on top of them, yes, the, the foundation model provider has the content, but they often don't have the context of in which the query is being made, um, which can make a huge difference to what the speech means. You run into some of this problem on social media where it's hard to decide whether something's bullying if you don't know the children in question and what references they're making to something that happened in school last week all the more so when the query is actually going into another piece of software that may be using it in a complicated way you just simply cannot see and do not understand. And then on top of, like, so, or sort of even further from an open point of view, um, truly open source models, there's not at present a way to make those models durably safe that, that I am aware of having asked. Because even if you release an open source model that has been trained to be safe on its own terms, it is relatively easy and significantly less computationally expensive to take that model and teach it to be unsafe again uh, than, it is to, than it is to train a model from the ground up to begin with. And there aren't really techniques today yet to embed safety into those models that you've then open sourced in a way that cannot be pulled back out relatively easily. Um, and so I worry a fair bit about that continuity being thought of as the same from a risk point of view. Because while things like BARD and ChatGPT are very prominent in everybody's minds, in a lot of ways, I think they are the least risky systems um, because they are the best controlled and the best understood where there's a pretty clear game plan about what to do uh, from there. The other thing that I, I think folks haven't hit on yet, and I just wanna add before we dive into the panel, is that I also do think that particularly the large language models and the large multimodal models, as models come to be able to uh, process both language and images and audio all at the same time are going to turn out to themselves be very useful for doing trust and safety, both for AI and for more traditional domains like social media, uh, where I think we can all agree the results have been at best mixed to date. Um, OpenAI released a blog post about this was something that I'd been working on fairly substantially before leaving. I genuinely recommend you all go read it. Um, but basically works through how we use GPT-4 to do policy writing and even some amount of content labeling and moderation. Because these models, yes, are generative, but they are also analytical. They can read and uh, do something like uh, information processing in a way you previously would have needed people to do. Um, and the speed advantage they give us from a safety point of view is, is really significant. Um, so that's what I got. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Can I can I actually, let me just start with you, Dave, uh, and then I want to uh, turn to the secretary just to build on something just, uh, and I guess the, the first way to ask this question and others on the panel should think about it is, what are you worried about most? Uh, mm -hmm. And, and so, so you sort of talked a little bit about the, the open source models and the API access or sort of unregulated, mm -hmm. unmonitored API access, and I suppose that's a family of concerns and mm -hmm. maybe that is the thing. But what is it, uh, you know, Obviously, as, as we talked about and as Dan alluded to, there was the, the letter about existential risks mm -hmm. and comparing it to nuclear war and um, um, you know, bioweapons and the like. Um, what, what do you think, as someone who's been you know, in the industry, uh, are, are we focusing on the right things? What should we be focusing on? What is it that, that mm -hmm. uh, concerned you there and now as you're out, what concerns you yeah. on the outside? Yeah, yeah. fair. Um, on the existential risk part of this, um, I, 
I think it is a valid worry, but it is a valid worry over the somewhat longer term by at least, I mean, not today, right? GPT-4 is not going to take over the world's nuclear arsenals and, and decide that we all are doomed. It's not anything like that powerful. Those kinds of worries are about some slightly further out future. There's a lot of disagreement on how far out that is and how much risk there is. I am very much not an expert on that kind of forecasting. But at least today, I do not think that is the highest profile risk. I think right now, uh, the highest profile risks are the ones that are in some ways less sexy and less talked about. So I'm worried quite a bit about the audio generative models, which is not nearly as flashy as the LLMs. Um, but we are at a point where 15, 20 seconds of audio recording of basically anybody's voice can be converted into something that can read text as you very convincingly. And I think we are going to see that show up in really banal things. I mean, everybody worries about misinformation. That's that's valid. That's important. But we're going to see it show up in scams. Um, we're going to see, see it show up in like traditional 419s where somebody who you think is your family member calls you and asks for your bank account information, and they're gonna be on the phone and they're gonna sound upset, and so you're going to believe it because we're not all used to yet living in a world where that can be faked. Um, similarly, I think the uh, image models and the soon-to-come video models are also places where, yes, there will be risk of mis- and disinformation, but there's also going to be a lot of risk to individual people. Um, and in the closed source context, that'll get managed in the same way it's managed today for something like Dolly or Whisper. Uh, but in the open source context, it's very hard to think through how you make those models unable to be used in those ways. And so I do think we will see them proliferate um, in, in ways that will be hard to control. Great. Let me, let me turn to Secretary Artigas here in, in, in thinking about sort of what, what you're worried about, but also sort of to think about, um, well, let me put it this way. Someone has, has said to me, regulating AI is like regulating the alphabet. Right, that it's that it's it's there's a there's a it's a kind of meta technology that it's sort of hard to even think. About. And the AI Act has a particular view about how to regulate in certain contexts, uh, um, uh, et cetera. And so I, I sort of want to get a sense on this panel of sort of the costs and benefits of regulation, but also just thinking. Um, so, so how are you thinking about this technology and, and how it, it should be regulated? Um, it, it, I mean, is this, how dissimilar is it from the other types of efforts in Europe to, uh, to regulate, whether it's social media uh, and other technologies? Yes, but um, I, I would agree, uh, but it is not as this. So as Mr. Degra has already said, we're not pretending to regulate the technology per se. We are only regulated, regulating the high-risk uses of technology. So it's really uh, base object, uh, risk uh, based, and case by case um, centered. Because AI per se is not harmful. AI per se doesn't need to create uh, ha harm. It can be very, very, very beneficial. It is very beneficial, and we are only interested in regulating those cases where that can put uh, a risk either for companies, uh, for citizens or for uh, uh, health or for any other uh, interesting topic and, and even for our society itself. Mm -hmm. And I believe what, what uh, uh, Dave has already said, I mean the really uh, long-terminism approach that some companies have uh, followed is not the, the one that worries us most uh, because we are already seeing short-term impact on how the digital uh, um, um, platforms are influencing uh, public opinion, are, are uh, creating harm. And as I think it was, uh, I think uh, Mr. Janer uh, Jan Nalanier, no, was uh, this a technologist here from Silicon Valley once said. I mean, the real uh, threat is not a long-term threat that we are uh, an argument Armageddon uh, situation. Is the real threat is that we all became insane because we cannot believe <laughs> what we see, we cannot believe what we hear, we cannot believe what we, what we read, and that is the real short-term threat. And that's what you need to focus on. So we uh, believe that this risk-based approach is the right balance between ex-ante and ex post regulation. And, and she has already said, that's a challenge. If, because if we let, regulate too much beforehand, mm -hmm. then we are hamped interesting because we're only focus on the high-risk cases. The way this will work is if we are able to do that in such a dynamic way, because what we consider is a risk today cannot be a risk tomorrow. We could have developed safety technologies beyond what we can, we can see today. And this is precisely the moment we are in now, in the in negotiating. Defining what are absolutely forbidden cases of AI, mm -hmm. not even acceptable even are their technology feasible. What are the high risk 
and the introduction, as it has been lately uh, in, in, by the Parliament, on what do we expect to regulate at the uh, foundational model level or at the general purpose AI level. Just summarizing. Clearly, forbidden cases of AI, one, every, one, one everyone agrees, is uh, social scoring. We do not want to be in a China-like system, in a national surveillance governance system, where people have a national score. And that is a forbidden case of the law. The second one is the one that's being negotiated now, and that I think that the, 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 the importance is that we find really the fine line, is in the uh, use of facial recognition and other biometric uh, techniques in real time in open spaces by governments. We do not have a, cit a European citizens want to live in a surveillance capitalism, in a surveillance society. That I go to a demonstration and the governor knows if I was in the demonstration, as it has happened in the US during Black Lives Matter, and the government has the faces, the government has what were the, 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 the said in the, in, the, in the chart or whatever. We don't want that. But now there's a fine line between that and national security, because probably we, knew that we, we want to use that by our national authorities to prevent counterterrorism or to rescue a child that has been kidnapped and we want to follow him in real time. So that trade-off is very interesting how we solve it because otherwise we are creating a loophole for everything that under the umbrella of national security we can have border control, discrimination. So that's really one of the challenges we have in the presidency. And the rest are not <coughs> dangerous cases as he has mentioned. We expect a code of conduct of the industry, so the piece of AI Act is complemented by a code of conduct. And on the, in the GPI and the generative AI, it has something that's come to a table because I cannot pretend that somebody is responsible for the safety AI system if the one that has created the building block is not accountable. Uh -huh. And this is why we're introducing at a level of transparency transparency requirements for GPAI and foundational models, especially that they are not uh, infringing any <coughs> privacy data law or any copyright law. And that also is the, 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 thin, the thin line we need to be able to solve. I agree with, with uh, Mr. Wheeler that one of the hot topics now is also what do we do with open source? Yeah. Do we regulate open source with the same requirements as any private source? And I think High Institute has made a very interesting benchmarking on who is uh, now fulfilling better the AI Act requirements. And it is clearly stated, as we expected, that the uh, private models are very good at safety uh, protocols, but are very bad in transparency of how they have trained the model, the data they have used, the computer, the computer consumption, and the parameters they are modeling. While the open source are very open in data computing models and have no, we have no way to control the deployment. Mm -hmm. So I think that is one of the challenges. I would say, the law will not be perfect, but we prefer to have a, a law that is 80% perfect today, that nothing, and that this is going to be the far west, and we cannot uh, really control the negative impact. So we'll see. Dan, did you want to jump in on that? Or? Uh, sure. I mean, Maybe I guess. You don't have to, yeah, but no, no, I, I, I looked I, like you wanted to. No, it's a really interesting kind of dialogue here. Mm -hmm. And I guess let me say two points. Um, uh, in terms of this broader question, in terms of the costs and benefits of, of different approaches, I think one of the things that is so challenging is if you just uh, enumerate the concerns that have been articulated uh, in the past uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, they're really wide ranging. We're talking about cybersecurity, privacy, autonomy, uh, environmental costs, equity and bias, misinformation, labor yeah. displacement. And one of the real challenges here is is that every policymaker will have a different weight uh, on what they're really value, uh, sort of valuing mm -hmm. and trying to really address. And that kind of reminds me of a classic literature really coming out from Stephen Breyer, uh, former uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, where he talked about regulatory mismatch. If you're not clear about the goals that you're trying to address, mm -hmm. then the regulatory intervention that you design can often misfire. And let me give you one example of that. Uh, the call for registration of models that are GPT-4 scale and above, uh, I think is motivated by this sort of concern that uh, we're going to get a range of unanticipated harms. Mm -hmm. But if you think, uh, you know, a lot of what's been driving that debate within the U.S. context has been the fear about bioweapons risk. But there, the one paper that's out there actually about the discovery of toxic chemical compounds is not a large language model. It is a small model published in Nature and Machine Intelligence. Add to that the fact that what is going to happen to the technology is that if you just 
uh, have a threshold by parameter count or, or number of flops, mm -hmm. the capacity is going to improve with smaller and smaller models. So you're going to see gaming around those kinds of thresholds. And so it's not obvious to me that that's the right kind of trigger. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is one way, one thing that is so fundamentally uncertain is the magnitude of different kinds of harms. And so I'm very partial to something like an adverse event reporting system that the FDA has so that we can start to gain more insights uh, and be able to investigate what's the real kind of nature of kind of bioweapons risk associated with a particular kind of model. Let me say a second thing just on what Dave uh, and, the, and the Secretary uh, said, which is this real tension between open and closed models. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Dave articulated really nicely uh, kind of the, the, the one of the dominant kind of narratives here, which is that if it's a small number of industry actors who can control these kinds of models and only give like limited access, uh, we'll be able to kind of uh, uh, abide by certain sort of safety and security standards. I think the counter to that mm -hmm. uh, is um, that, uh, number one, <laughs> uh, the, the number of users are obviously much lower. Mm -hmm. you know, if you've got 100 million you know, monthly active users, the just actual scale of harm can be much higher uh, with uh, you know, a kind of chat GPT uh, style mm -hmm. model. Second is that th we have, we're having a lot of reflection on kind of how we got to cybersecurity standards. And the history there has been one where, where we have actually moved away from security by obscurity, mm -hmm. right? And more towards open standards so that a larger community can kind of really figure out how to uh, uh, meet and define these kinds of uh, standards. So the moment you start having uh, companies actually have an API where you can do fine tuning of large language models, right? The very thing that you're describing is like the, the sort of security, it like kind of goes away because people can really easily kind of evade, um, you know, a lot of the kind of RLHF kind of uh, safeguards that, that, that one might have built in. We, were, we yeah. were thinking through actually how we would do safety around fine tuning requests. Yeah. Yeah. So that's even really hard, there, right, yeah. like that's an API itself where you could think through, yeah. in a closed source context, having a fine-tuned model and then subjecting it to a battery of tests before you allow yeah. the fine-tuning end user to use it. So yeah. there, there are, you're totally yeah. right, it's but a really there challenging are moves yeah. there that you could do. Then, then the last thing I'll just say on this debate is that we often kind of stylize it into open versus closed. But there's been some really fantastic work, I think, uh, in part by the Center for Research on Foundation Models out of high, really to try to articulate that, you know, we really should be thinking about a spectrum mm -hmm. where you can have graduated releases of, uh, you know, uh, uh, more open type models where you're releasing the documentation, you're, you're kind mm -hmm. of giving uh, uh, more controlled access up until you've kind of vetted the thing. And, and I think that's uh, uh, one way in which to really uh, uh, think about building in kind of responsible <coughs> release policies that are consistent with open source development because I think the fear that many have is that if you need a license to develop a large language model, and that you have to have massive amounts of RLHF and, and kind of safeguards built in, then what that means is it's a small number of actors that mm -hmm. are actually going to be able to play in the space. That's going to close off the ecosystem. And the very kind of vetting that we've seen work very well in the cybersecurity context will be closed off uh, for the future of large language models. Mm -hmm. Dave, you and I, I, I want to turn to Gerard and Florence, but Dave, you and I have spoken about the difference between the cybersecurity yeah, model, I, I, and, and so why don't you spend a minute or so, because uh, I know you have views on this, about yeah. the difference between cybersecurity open sourcing versus the LLM yeah, open yeah. sourcing. Absolutely, and, and to be clear, like, I don't, I don't particularly like my point of view here. <laughs> to, to, like, it's more that I don't understand what the articulable plan is for the alternative. So. Um, in the, I'm not, I've heard other people make the argument about cybersecurity. I'm not totally sure it fits uh, because in the cybersecurity context, think about like database software, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody running a database wants their own database to be secure, even if they want to do bad things with the database. Mm -hmm. So the individual user's incentives are aligned with the collective effort on making better, more secure databases to a much greater extent than I think is the case in the language model context. And I'll, I'll go on to a specific example, which is a little unpleasant, so apologies for this in advance. But um, we, we don't agree on what content we don't want large language models or large image models to be able to make. And in fact, con conflict over that, what is fundamentally a content policy disagreement, is I think going to be central to a lot of this going forward because we simply aren't aligned. And it's, a, it's an extreme example, but it's a real specific example. Um, Stable Diffusion open sourced their image models, and there has been work where a 
folks in the uh, unfortunate part of the community took that open sourced image model and trained it to be able to make novel images of child exploitation of real existing victims by training it on actual CSAM, which is a, a really awful thing to have to bring up in public. I don't understand what the plan is to prevent that kind of harm from being possible in an open source context. Maybe there is one, right? But I don't know how we get to keeping that from being possible. I've not yet heard anybody articulate a method or even a research approach that would sort of get us there. And that's where, that kind of thing is where my worry comes in, in the same way that if you've got, right now, maybe the, the large language models aren't the biggest concern for bioweapons, but if you start to have models where that is a concern, if you've got open source ones and we do not have techniques for locking down what they're able to be trained to do, all you need is one bad actor with a moderate amount of compute to start to move in problematic directions. I would be delighted to understand a plan where I'm, I'm wrong. Like I would prefer to be wrong here, but it's, it is my greatest fear. I'll say we, you know, in the Stanford Internet Observatory a few months ago, they published the, I think what is really the first study on um, this sort of open source model generated child sexual abuse material, which will make your hair sort of stand up. Um, but it is sort of, you know, the future is now on this. I mean, this is happening already. Um, and the open, and you, there's no way you're gonna be able to dial back no. the open source models that are there, which are already creating what looks like, you know, photorealistic imagery of really uh, awful stuff. And so um, I, I don't want to dwell on that and make that the, the topic of our, of our discussion here, but, but I do want to, so, so it is a challenge about, I think, the ability to regulate in this area mm -hmm. um, and, and what, that, what that's going to look like. Um, uh, Gerard, it, uh, did you want to jump in on this also and sort of thinking about how that maybe the EU uh, tries to navigate these different yeah. benefits and costs? Sure, Nat. If, if you give me an opportunity to jump in, I'll jump in immediately. <laughs> I'm very energized. I mean, I think this is a terrific panel. I'm excluding myself a bit from this. It's, if I start talking nonsense all of the time, it'd still be a terrific panel. I've, I've learned a lot, and that's like my standard of earth, a terrific panel. I, I, this kind of, I'm energized. I've got four things I want to say. I think the first comment, I mean, I think, Florence made it, I mean, th there's a lack of trust in our societies for this technology. I think that's a starting point. No technology can develop, no market will develop if more than like, I mean, I think the global average is 56 people around the, the world. I mean, in some members, countries higher and other lower, but on average, like one in two citizens on this planet don't trust AI. And so here, there is an important role here to make sure that that technology can be trusted. Uh, it's, it's as much a kind of a values democracy argument as it is a market element. I mean, you cannot grow a market when half of your potential customers don't trust you. So that's like, I think, and we have an advantage in the European Union, and, and I think the State Secretary mentioned it. We have GDPR. We have a copyright framework. We have cybersecurity framework. I mean, the kind of things that, I mean, people want to be sure that their data are protected. I mean, the, 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 the ones who are, the creators want to be sure that the copyright is protected. We have those frameworks in place, and I think there's still some work to be done in this country. I, I was at Dreamforce the last three days. I mean, it was kind of presented as the biggest AI conference in the world, more than 40,000 people. You talk to the industries here, many of them don't trust. I mean, with all the good work that ChatGPT and, I mean, OpenAI are doing, they don't trust these systems. So what is, for example, Salesforce doing? They say, well, we're going to help you. We're going to mask your data before it goes through one of these large language models. And when it comes out, because one of the other things we, of course, need to acknowledge is that these large language models are far from perfect. They hallucinate. I mean, it's still a lot of work to be done. They don't want to be sending mass emails to their customers that has kind of bad language in, in, in them. So, so it's, it's a trust issue, and I think there's a lot of work still to be done. When I came here one year ago, I mean, people were laughing about EU. Why are you regulating AI? It's a te new technology. I mean, you, can, uh, I mean you, 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 you don't understand it. Uh, it's moving so fast. It's changing all of the time. The EU can't compete on the technology, so you're going to try to regulate us down to the ground. Uh, and you're stifling innovation. Well, just, I mean, maybe just to, I mean, it's not a, a joke. I mean, yes, sometimes we want to stifle innovation in the, in the EU, like the social security scoring system. Yes, we definitely want to stifle innovation <laughs> in, the, in that area. I mean, like in nuclear, 
And we also want to stifle innovation in, in nuclear. So there's nothing wrong sometimes with governments saying that's not the innovation we want. Look at all the innovation we've seen in the financial markets and look where it got us like 15 years ago. That's not the innovation we want. Yes, we do want sometimes to stifle innovation. But you can regulate uh, I mean, not the technology, but how the technology is used. Look at GDPR or going back to the data protection directive of 1995. 1998, I mean, the e-commerce directive, 1998, 2000, still in force, uh, more than 25 years. So it stood the, the test of time. As long as you don't regulate the technology, but how it's used, it can be done. I think we also have to acknowledge there's a lot we don't know. I mean, I just mentioned the electronic commerce directive. At the time when we kind of, the internet was World Wide Web, and we thought it was all going to be about commerce. I mean, we weren't thinking like it's maybe going to be something like called social media, etc. So there's, I think we also have to acknowledge, and I sometimes make the mistake here. I ask kind of experts like Dave, say, well, what do you think it, the, the world will look like in a year's time, or in two years' time, or three years' time? And people like Dave say, well, nobody knows. I mean, ask me what the world will look like in two months or three months. Maybe I have a kind of a bit of an educated guess. So uh, humility, being humble, I think, is also a, a good trait at this moment. Third point, I've got one more point, but just very quick, and then I'll shut up. One is, I mean, the kind of questions that we, we are discussing here, I mean, we talk a lot about multi-stakeholder, et cetera, and I think we have not seen enough multi-stakeholder in these discussions. It's essentially been a discussion with a limited group of very big companies that are kind of driving the agenda here. That's not acceptable. But the best multi-stakeholder model in the world is our elected representatives. It's our democracies, that because the qu kind of questions that we're now facing require decisions that are kind of supported by our societies. And the best decisions in the democ democracy are decisions taken by, in our case, the Council of Ministers of the European Parliament. So there's just an argument to be set here. Do we need rules? Is this a technology that will impact so fundamentally on our lives, on our societies, on our communities, on, on us as individuals, that our elected representatives, whom we have given the, the power, the authority to kind of protect us and to, to put like these type of conditions, but should they not be called upon to say this is the way we're going to deal with it? And I think that's a very fundamental point about democracy. You asked, Nate, and my last point is like, well, what, what kind of, well, not, the, I didn't think you formulated like what keeps you awake at night, and I, I've been regularly asked, and I have no answer to this question, what's your P-Doom? I mean, first I had to find out what P-Doom meant. I, I guess you just said, sleep well. Is that, I, that, sleep, that's, yeah, I yeah. sleep not enough, but when I sleep, I sleep <laughs> well. But I think the points that, I mean, uh, uh, Professor Ho made, uh, I think these are, I mean, A, it's to get it right as much as we can get it right. It will not be perfect, as the State Secretary said, but like making sure it's proportional. We, we're not going to shoot ourselves in the foot, imposing massive burdens on those who we would like to succeed in the future. So to get that balance right between protection and kind of uh, obligations <coughs> is very critical. Then, of course, also the enforcement part of this, because this we're discussing a piece of legislation. Of course, any piece of legislation will only be as effective as its enforcement is. And I think Professor Ho made some important comments here about this isn't just challenging for industry. I mean, we are, I mean, I've dealt with the DSA and the DMA. And of course, I mean, big tech, small tech, all tech is, they're all preparing for this. But, but I mean, do not underestimate, because this was like the directorate I used to lead in DG Connect, which is going to become effectively the global enforcement directorate for the DSA together with DG Competition for the DMA. I mean, we are recruiting like mad. Uh, we, we have the, the uh, very good uh, European Center of Algorithmic Transparency who's going to, in Seville, which is going to help us. Do not underestimate the pressure on the regulator to kind of build these capacities. And I saw a statistic that Russell Wald put on the screen at some event that I've even forgot where, where it was, where like current recruitment, I mean, uh, so AI kind of graduates, AI mm -hmm. experts, where do they go? they go 95, 96%, they go to the private sector. Very few of them go to the public sector. I mean, a few more maybe go to, to, to the excellence institutes here like at Stanford. So that, that is a challenge. I mean, we need to kind of have that expertise. We, are, we have a framework already in place because we're gonna use the market surveillance authorities. I mean, this is, this is as I said, it's a product safety approach. So we have the, the, the enforcement capacity is the market surveillance. But these market surveillance authorities, what do they do today? They go and check the, the sell-by date of yogurt. Now, this has to be taken off the shelves because the sell-by date has passed. They're going to check whether lawnmowers are safe. They're going to check like whether some machinery is safe. I mean, the elevator is not going to kind of 
crash down to the to the ground floor if you push the button. So that, that's what they are kind of expert in. I mean, they need to build up a lot of expertise. And this then kind of goes back to like, what is the, 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 the transitional period? And, and the discussion, of course, is going to be a political one. Is it going to be like I mean, minimum two years? Is it going to be longer? That's not because we want to delay, because, of course, a lot of people say, well, we need it now. Eh? The criticism I got first was, why are you regulating in the EU? The criticism I get now is, why, why does it take so long to regulate in the EU? But in the kind of the transitional period, we need to make sure we have these standards in place, because otherwise the EU regulations will not work, and we have the enforcement capacity in place. And that's not going to be a small challenge. Dan, it looked like you wanted to jump in quickly. Then, yeah. Florence, I'm going to go to you, and then uh, the secretary to close us out. Yeah. yeah, I just want to kind of connect, I think, uh, what Shahad said and, and what Dave uh, mm -hmm. uh, really nicely said earlier, which is this point about democratic deliberation. And, and I think that the statistic from the high index, right, is 60% of AI PhDs go into pri in the private sector, 20 to 25% go into the academy, less than 2% goes into the public sector. Mm -hmm. That is a fundamental thing that has to change if we're going to get uh, uh, AI regulation right. But let me connect the point about, like, who actually gets to decide this? Because I think, Dave, you started off your answer on the open source kind of position that you yourself uh, disclaim that you, you're not comfortable actually having to say, right? Is it that, that there's no agreement here, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly the concern, right? Is that if there are such fundamental disagreements as to what values we should be pro protecting when there, are in, when there are deep tensions between them, why should it be in the hands of a small number of individuals to make those decisions? And that's at core what is getting to kind of the open versus closed source debate as to whether it should ex be exclusively engineers inside a small number of companies being able to draw these trade-offs or to figure out how to have a more open uh, kind of ecosystem. I agree with you that we don't have pan technical panaceas here. Mm -hmm. I would submit neither does industry, right? Like everyone is still very much trying to figure out mm -hmm. because there are emergent risks that we just don't really uh, know about. There's a lot of fantastic work going on actually here at Stanford Stanford, for instance, by graduate students that are working on, you know, you've got Peter Henderson uh, uh, working on things like self-destructing models that make it much harder to actually uh, game these kinds of mm -hmm. models. You can combine forms of watermarking in the imaging context to actually combine that with uh, the responsible AI licenses to actually do uh, much better monitoring and enforcement of these mm -hmm. kinds of things. And I think those are exactly the kinds of paths that we should be exploring. And the point really about open versus closed source is that we should not prevent that ecosystem from e being able to explore those paths, right? It should not require the, the you know, uh, PhD students to necessarily have to go to a small number of companies mm -hmm. to be able to work uh, on these kinds of issues. And then the third and last point I think really goes to the EU AI Act, which is that, you know, when you focus on some of these documented uh, uh, forms of emergent risk, like bioweapons, what often those actually underscore is gaps in existing regulatory mm -hmm. authorities mm -hmm. that have much mm -hmm. less to do with AI. It's the mm -hmm. fact that you know the MIT paper that talked about bioweapons risk points to unregistered laboratories where people might be able to secure pathogens. Well, maybe the direct way mm -hmm. of getting at that is not to regulate mm -hmm. you know, language models or close off the, the sort of innovation ecosystem, but to think about how those models might actually help us shore up uh, vulnerabilities in existing regulatory authorities. Florence, and then the uh, secretary will take us home here, yeah. Yes, uh, it's, it's, it's another point, but I'm, I'm very sensitive to um, this, this question of trust and the lack of trust, um, um, the, the lack of trust about technology. I would just like to mention this phenomenon called the privacy paradox. I, I don't know if you have heard of it, um, but it's something that is known in the literature uh, that is mentioned about the, the enforcement of the GDPR. Basically, the privacy paradox is the fact that when you make a survey and you ask European citizens if they want their personal data to be protected, they massively answer yes. And then the next question is, do you read the terms of use? And then they massively <laughs> answer no. And then the next question is, do you consent uh, for to uh, the fact that your personal data are processed and they massively say yes. So my conclusion to this mm. would be just to say, okay, so sometimes we are worried, sometimes we are concerned, but we want to use the technology, we want to use the digital service that is offered to us and often is often free. And so this is what I would like to say about AI and about the AI Act, because in the, AI, the, the latest draft you have specific provisions 
that say that people need to be informed when they interact with an AI. They need to know that a certain content was um, machine generated. But I'm not that sure. So it's, of course, necessary and important, but I'm not that sure that we are the, in the best place to protect ourselves. We need to be informed. But as individuals, we also need the protection of established authorities about f from regulators, of course, uh, not exclusively regulators. And th this would be my only point, which, which, which would be to say, OK, we, we are facing a world where, where we will build intimate relationships with with AI tools and so with this risk of manipulation with and so so yes so it's clearly necessary to have safeguards and and to have really clear guidelines and, and limits um, uh, so that we are not manipulated um, uh, to an extent that of course we don't want secretary uh, uh, bring us home here what, what have you heard, what have you heard here today that uh, makes you think about this well very exciting conversation and, and I hope we can continue some of it during the lunch time I love very very yes food for thought and and what I would like to point out is two things that, that are, are being commented I think it's more worth mentioning this discussion about open and closed model of course even though we we can now guarantee that if we only rely on uh, uh, privately owned uh, models that will be secure, that will be not uh, recommendable because we are creating and enhancing the existing monopolies. And I think the original sin of artificial intelligence is that has not been developed by academia. It has mm -hmm. been developed by industry. Mm -hmm. Not because the, in the academia did not have the talent, that it didn't have it because, of course, we are making great effort uh, being here in Stanford and not working for the next uh, big tech uh, in, in, in the street because it's, they are much more competitive. They are being to uh, they pay high salaries. So people who are devoted to research now, imagine in Europe or imagine in, in Spain, have less opportunities uh, than in the private sector because they have been data monopolies and they have had they, it has been only the industry that has had access to the data to develop those models. For free, paying nothing to people, paying nothing to anyone, okay? Even not asking for a permit. And that is the original sin. And I think we need to revert back that, that, that situation as soon as possible. I think the first great effort has been OpenAI. Uh, uh, OpenAI was the initial to have an open uh, effort. And while somebody thought that Google could have any, any competitor, OpenAI, uh, got into the table and, and, and you know, uh, shaked everything. So I think that's the way to go because we do not open the standards, there will be always monopolies. And uh, we need to think about Europe not only on the AI Act, we need to think about the DSA, Digital Services Act, DMA, Digital uh, Market Act, when we want to have a fair play and equal opportunities for small and medium businesses and not great monopolies. And we s n n uh, need to regulate those monopolies too because we, uh, we, de we ask them to open up the, their training data. Uh, the Data Act is also helping and, and creating data marketplaces in Europe. Only 7% of the data available and IoT-generated data is used to create data marketplaces to improve products and services innovation. So we need to also tackle the, 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 the original scene, as I mentioned. And we need to revert back the power of academia uh, versus the power of industry. So I'm in favor of opening up. Of course, it's very, very welcome, uh, all the efforts that industry is saying, OK, and I solve this problem. But because we cannot solve it only from the technical point of view, we need law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the, if the self-censorship self and the code of conduct the industry leads us to make a focus on that, that is going to become a business opportunity, and somebody will, will do research on that. As I say, guys, this is the sign of the time. Every time I have the lobbies trying to convince us to go a different way, guys, you are not reading the sign of the times. Privacy will be a great business. Protection will be a great business. You know, Doing things right will be a great business. I think it's a good business to be sustainable and having the green label. So that is a good business. Just invest on that. Do research on that. If we don't put the focus on that is important, nobody will devote efforts to that. So that's number one. And second, there are bad guys everywhere. Today, somebody can send a picture of me in an intimate moment to another person via WhatsApp. Technology cannot prevent that to happen. But law, see, if somebody is doing that against my consent, it goes to jail. And this is happening today. So we need to tell these guys that are using this open source to harmful things that they will go to jail because there is no possibility today to prevent them from doing harm. Even though we cannot prevent financial fraud, even though we have 
thousands of laws to prevent financial fraud. So I think this is why policies need to be developed. We need to think that there uh, must be a case where everything can go wrong, and we need to protect the citizens. This is, again, why I say that it's not only legislating through technical standards or through principles. We need to legislate to protect basic fundamental rights. And last but not least, this is why I always think that the AI Act is not only a legal standard, not only a technical standard, but above all, a moral standard. Mm -hmm. We're telling the world what is going to be acceptable and not acceptable to do with our data or with an AI tool. And probably we are regulating or hyper-regulating or over-regulating in Europe. But what we are going to achieve here through regulation probably can be achieved in the state by reputation. Because even though it's legal in your country, me as a citizen or me as a consumer, I'm not going to accept that do you that, that with my data and your stock market price will go down. Mm -hmm. And even in China, where we think that they are not worried at all about this, they are also starting to regulate deep fakes. Mm -hmm. So this is why, at the end of the day, if we're creating this citizen's awareness of the power of deciding who I want to do what with my data, as we created with GPR that has become a golden standard, I think the AI Act could become also a golden standard because we're telling the world what can be done or not. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you again. This has been a wonderful way to kick off our uh, quarter here at Stanford and to kick off our new program on governance of emerging technologies. We hope you'll join us again for our many events, in particular our Tuesday uh, noon Pacific uh, uh, seminars that we have um, in the Moganam Conference Room as well as uh, online to the, to the throngs who have watched. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. Uh, and we look forward to having you back to Stanford again. Thank you very much.